today. My name is Jolene Olson. I'm a partner and the administrative director for the Factor Service. We are delighted to bring you this series, A Market Wizards Dialogue. Our ser series first began in November with Peter Brandt interviewing Jack Schrager about his new book and his project Fun Cedar. I put a link to that recording in the comment section. Please copy and save this to listen later. Today the tables will be turned and Jack will interview Peter and he'll give insights on 40 plus years of trading and what's on the horizon for him and the factor service. And now it's my pleasure to welcome Peter Brandt and Jack Schwager. Hey Jack. This is Jack Schwager. Hey, hey Peter, how are you? Thanks Jolene. Uh, okay, so today I get to sit back and let you do the work, Peter. Um, <laughs> It's it's a lot of work asking good questions, Jack, and you've been you, you you've uh, you perfected that over the years. Thanks. Well, we'll find out. So, Peter, let's. Uh, I, we're not we're not to make sure we don't have enough time to finish. Let me start at the beginning. Why don't you tell us how you first even became aware of markets and uh, and what got you interested in trading? Well, you know, I graduated from the University of Minnesota, and then my wife and I, and, and our oldest child at the time we had one, we moved to, to Chicago. I had graduated in advertising and took a job in Chicago with a very large ad, advertising agency, uh, working on some real big accounts, including McDonald's and uh, Campbell Soup Company. Uh, and so I had a friend, we lived in Evanston, Illinois, and, and there, was, there was a friend that I met who was a a soybean trader at the Chicago Board of Trade. John uh, said, hey, come on down and I'll buy you lunch. You can see what I did. And I, w I went down to the Board of Trade and I was instantly captivated by the idea that these guys are out uh, living uh, by their wits. They can determine at the end of each day what, what they have done, uh, their work for themselves. They have the opportunity uh, to do well financially. Uh, they don't have to sit in meetings and write memos and, and answer to people and, and what a cool thing. And so a dial like came along and about a, a half a year later I decided uh, I, I really want to be a trader. That's what I want to do. And that was 1974. My goodness, you know, that's, that half of our audience today probably were not even alive or not even uh, an idea in their parents' head at that point. And, uh, so I, uh, I just knock on doors and I found an opportunity to work for half of what I had been making in advertising with Continental Grain Company and uh, started out and it's kind of like, okay, uh, we've hired you now figure out a way to make a living. And, uh, and so that got me involved initially in the corn pit and uh, it took me a few years to learn the ropes. I, I knew I had to learn the ropes. and. Uh, it wiped out a few accounts in the first uh, three, four years before I kind of finally got my bearing, but that was my introduction. I knew from the beginning that uh, I wanted to be a trader, but to tell you the truth, Jack, I'm not sure I even knew what that meant in 1974, 1975. Well, were you a broker or from the floor? What, what exactly were you doing? What was your role? Well, yeah, I was, and you know, it so happened I knew uh, top management at Campbell Soup and McDonald's, and so I, when I went, uh, I, I approached those, and that was just after the first big run-up in grain prices, where uh, consumers, users of raw materials, particularly agricultural goods, really got caught. They got they got caught short-handed, and uh, with the Russian wheat deal and the first big run-up in 72, 73 in the green markets, and all of a sudden hedging was something that, that corporations were considering. And so uh, Campbell's and Mc or McDonald's had not hedged at that point in time, and so really I became kind of a customer's man, uh, handling uh, the hedging requirements of, of uh, Campbell's and McDonald's went on to include Homestake Mining and, and a few other customers. And so, so your customers uh, were mainly uh, were mainly hedgers, not not spec customers. No, 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 not spec customers at all. They were, so they that made your opinion that made your opinion less critical because if they were true hedgers, then you know they're hedgers. It's not the same thing. Well, of course, even back then, a true hedger really they weren't really sure what that even meant to be a true hedger. There was still some unresolved issues on how hedges are taxed and uh, how they're reported and how they go against cash positions. So, you know, it was really early on. It was early in the game and, and people were still trying to figure out what it even meant to be a commercial at that point in time. But it did uh, it did pay the bills, uh, you know, and so 
uh, I had an advantage over some people who, who are becoming traders today in that I had a source of, of income to go along with uh, the learning portion of what the futures markets were all about. And, and uh, that was a great luxury and I consider did, myself... Did you poor. trade your own account at that time or not? Uh, no, I did. I was allowed to trade my own account. Uh, and, and so, you, you know, but I, I, I went to work for Continental and, and it took me probably a half a year to start generating the type of income where I could put money away and I'd open an account for five, ten thousand dollars and basically wipe it out and uh, just start over again and during the process tried a little bit of everything. You know, I, I tried trading based on fundamentals, based on cycles, based on seasonal spreads, point and figure charts, uh, analog years, I mean, you name it, I tried it and uh, largely to no success and so I probably uh, did a pretty good job of destruction on three or four accounts before I I started settling into how I would eventually trade. It's interesting that you mentioned one of the things that I did myself which is you know, start when starting trading to have very small amounts, I remember even the smallest 2,000 and wiping out uh, several times and and just the, the advice I give people is uh, is if they're starting out uh, to do that because they're likely to lose and they might as well pay less for their uh, for their uh, education and it's, it's uh, interesting to see that you actually were doing the same thing. Yeah, you know, it was almost a joke at the board of trade uh, among guys that handle speculator type business back then. And of course, nobody traded on computers like they do now. I mean, there wasn't such a thing as trading platforms, but. You know, everybody called their orders in and talked to a broker, but but kind of the joke uh, among the spec guys were was that the, the worst thing that could happen to their customer was that they were, they'd be right on the first one or two trades because that was pretty much the kiss of death. Right, and they uh, they believe that they actually know what they're doing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Well, actually, that's one of the things I say. Uh, it's uh, funny, like people think uh, they can read a book on trading and then. And then go become great traders, and they don't think like that about anything else in the world. I mean, you know, nobody would, nobody would think about reading a book on brain surgery, doing brain surgery, right? Uh, but they do about trading, and it's exactly, I think, the reason because it's the only thing where, if you know absolutely nothing, you still have a 50/50 shot of being right because you might just pick the right direction. So in the beginning, kind of fools a lot of people. Yeah, you can get lucky. Yeah, uh, and in and, and in some ways, I think those guys that that said that's the worst thing that could happen to a trader were absolutely right. So how did you finally um, find a, a method that, that worked for you? Well, you know, I was aware of what guys were doing, uh, you know, on the floor and off the floor. I mean, there are a lot of guys that traded on the floor. There are guys that handled paper and guys that uh, did decks for commercials like me. And then there were a lot of speculative guys that were members. And, uh, um, and so... A, a guy that I became pretty good friends with it was a chartist, and uh, you know he said, "Hey, come on over." We went to the bookstore right on Jackson Boulevard, uh, in the next building over from the Chicago Board of Trade, and uh, he bought me the the fifth edition of the Edwards and McGee book, and and I consumed it pretty much in a weekend. Uh, you know, it made sense to me. You know, I read it and it resonated with me. I, you know, all of a sudden, you know, here's a way to try to understand markets. It's, it's a frame of reference for what markets are going to do, but, but, but more so, it, it provides me uh, some sort of indication of timing and uh, some sort of indication of how I'm going to manage a trade or the risk of a trade. But, you know, that's really where, where the learning begins. I mean, that's, that's, it's from that point that, that, you know, that you make all kinds of mistakes, and I made all kinds of mistakes. I mean, you have to figure out, so you're a chartist. What does that mean? I mean, what are you looking for in charts? How are you going to size trades? Are you going to enter trades? How are you going to manage trades? How often are you going to trade? Um, if you're a pattern trader, what patterns are you trading? Uh, and so, you know, there's just a uh, hundred questions that come after the uh, fact that you say, well, I'm going to be a trader and I'm going to be a classical chartist, which I define myself in. Uh, I mean, that's what I look for is the basic classical patterns. And, but, you know, that doesn't begin to describe all of the mistakes you eventually have to make. And that's, you know, whether you can learn from those mistakes and still have your capital intact at the end of the day is, 
is the determination as to maybe where your career as a trader is going to go, whether you really want to be a full-time trader or whether you want to just kind of trade on the side in addition to another job you're doing, but, but whatever it may be, it's you learn from mistakes. I'm curious, since you were on the floor, I think you said the corn pit, were you only trading one market uh, or were you still trading multiple markets when you were wiping out these small accounts? No, I was trading all, all kinds of different markets, but primarily mercantile exchange. You know, every once in a while, I'd, I'd wander off and become adventurous and trade a, a market in New York. I traded copper. I liked trading copper actually in the early days, but you know, I traded more okay. to trade markets. And, uh, how many years into your first trading did you hit upon Edison McGee and begin using charts as, you know, experimenting with charts and developing a methodology with charts? Uh, how many years before you actually even began that process? And oh, I think once about you started using charts, how long till you became actually profitable with that methodology? Uh, I think that I started basically playing around with charts in 1978. Uh, in you know early 78, uh, maybe the second quarter of 78, uh, and, and then I, I still felt that I was onto something that eventually would work, but I needed to figure out what that looked like. To eventually work, and and uh, but I didn't wipe out any accounts once I became a chartist. That didn't mean I became profitable either. I think it wasn't until uh, early 1979, mid 1979, that actually I started uh, figuring out how to how to make money and keep it. I mean, and that's the challenge, Jack. The challenge once you uh, become a trader and know what you're doing is not necessarily making money. The challenge is keeping what you made and, and not giving it all back by doing stupid things. And, uh, and, and so I think it was probably 1978, early 1979, mid-1979 that I actually felt like, hey, I, I, I'm, I think I know what I'm doing. I mean, I, I, I feel comfortable doing what I'm doing. But it wasn't then until 1980 that I had uh, a, a really decent year. I was still, uh, I was still dealing with Continental Grain and McDonald's and uh, uh, in, in commercial accounts. And then in 1981, I felt confident enough that uh, I felt like, okay, it's, it's time to jump out of the nest and see if my wings work and fly. And it was then 1981 that. Uh, I left Continental, formed uh, Factor Trading as a proprietary trading firm uh, at the Board of Trade, and uh, you know, uh, took the leap of faith. That's a tough thing to do. Is, is that leap of faith part is uh, that's a beast when you finally say, okay, I'm all in, right? It's like uh, it's like it's, it's like playing Texas Hold'em poker, and you go. So, you know, so that's that means you. Does that mean you gave up managing customer accounts and just focusing your own trading totally? Yeah. Is that? Exactly. Exactly. And, and you mentioned, uh, you know, and I couldn't agree more, that the the trick is not making money, but the, the difficult part is keeping it. So, what did you learn, and what advice could you give the people listening here uh, about how how you do keep what you make, or you know, uh, some significant portion of it? Well, you know, I think those of us that that came from the the floor. Uh, from the exchanges, and of course, Jack, you were you were at uh, Commodities Corp, and you were connected with traders way back, and at that same point in time, and so we we lived a community. There was a community sense. I mean, I couldn't ride an elevator without having two or three uh, traders in the same elevator. I couldn't go to lunch without having traders at the next uh, chair, uh, chair over. Uh, it, the guys today that uh, open up and they go down their basement and start a, a, a computer up and pull up a program do not have that. I was lucky enough to have a couple of really, really, really uh, good guys that were willing to, you know, really uh, uh, share with me about where they were. And one in particular was a guy that handled a, a discretionary book for Cargill. He traded uh, spec. He, he pretty much could trade a limit position. And uh, he taught me an awful lot about uh, risk control. And he, he had some rules that he had, and that is never take a loss home on a, uh, on a Friday, never risk any more than 1% of your capital on a trade, uh, never sit with a trade that's closed against you for more than two days. 
And so, you know, he had a lot of wisdom in terms of uh, bailing out of trades that weren't working and not having a not uh, not having your trades somehow be a reflection of your integrity or your wisdom. And a trade was a trade, and if it's working, you, you try to keep it. If it's not working, you bail out. And uh, I was lucky enough to have some really good money managers uh, give me some advice as I was as I was going there. 19, late 1978, 79, 80, guys were really speaking into my life. And I, I to tell you the truth, I'm not sure I would have made it without them. Did you say one of the rules was never keep a trade that goes against you more than two days? Because that seems uh, awfully uh, sensitive to getting knocked out, uh, even on good trades. Well, it is. It is sensitive, and it's the way that I've learned to trade. I, I don't have anything against somebody who is who is willing to give a market a little more room. If that's their thing, that's their thing. What it does, Jack, for me, though, is it places an enormous priority over time on timing. Uh, my approach to trading is probably much more timing sensitive than other people's approach whereby they w are willing to let a trade trade against them uh, for two, three, four days, a week, two weeks before the trade finally starts to gain ground and, and get its footing where I, I'm just not willing to do that and, and uh, I think that had I started with a substantially greater amount of money in my account. I started with, uh, you know, just just under a hundred thousand uh, dollars with Factor. That was the capital stake, and of course, that uh, back then we were trading copper at fifty-five cents, and so, you know, it, it uh, money went a little bit further in terms of in terms of leverage and number of contracts. But uh, you know, it was a small enough amount that I wasn't willing to really sit around in a trade. Uh, for too long, and it just is the way that I evolved as a trader. Again, does, I, I, does, that, um, does that mean, though, that let's say that's your day rule, if you're behind on the trade, or even if you're well ahead on the trade? No, if I'm well ahead in the trade, I try to give it room. Uh, it's, okay. If so I'm behind talking, on the trade, but to clarify, we're talking about if you're if you're not uh, if you're not above order yet, and then you get two days against you, which is quite a different yep. thing. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and usually if I, it's against me two days and it doesn't go the third day, I blow it. Uh, but once a trade has put some distance between my entry and where it is, uh, I think the challenge, uh, the hard part is the patience to say I'm going to give it then room to move. And, uh, uh, you know, perhaps even back to where I got in, at least in the early stages of the trade, the first two, three weeks, is, is give it room to to back and fill a little bit before it really starts moving, but uh, because I take a lot of small losses, I have got to have some big profits. And you know, I've traded a, enough contracts over the years, thousands and thousands of contracts, pretty much the same approach to trading, that I think I have pretty good, uh, a pretty good benchmarks and understanding the metrics of of my trading and. And uh, I, I know that uh, if I trade 100 times, my net profit, Jack, will probably come from about eight of those trades. And that means 92 of those trades are throwaways. Right. That, that you mentioned uh, the fellow who, who was, sort of gave you this advice on the risk management, which is obviously very instrumental. Uh, was he your mentor, or were there any other mentors? Yeah, he was more than any other, and he became a really good friend, as a matter of fact. He was a single guy. He would spend holidays with my family. He actually borrowed my wife and I money to put down as the down payment of our first house in uh, in Wilmette, Illinois, and so he became a very dear friend. He's passed away. He, he died about 15 years ago, uh, but uh, he was a mentor and a friend, and of course, we talk a lot about markets, and uh, he was an extreme, probably the best trader I've ever met and have ever known, and, uh, and so he didn't really give me advice like buy beans, sell beans, uh, spread corn, but he talked more in terms of principles and concepts and philosophies, and I think those things are, are of much more value to a new trader than necessarily trade identification and where to get in and out. Yeah, I think it's important to emphasize here that it seems what you're saying is that uh, while he was in really key to your probably success, that all, all this valuable advice that you really got from him, all of it really falls in the category of what we might call risk control. Uh, none of it seems, sounds like it had anything to do with trade entry, which is where most people try to focus on. 
Yeah, as a matter of fact, you know, he traded in a way that I, I you know, he'd, he'd hold a trade for six months. I, I can't hold a trade for six months. I'd go crazy. But uh, he would, if a trade was profitable, he would literally let it try to run for a half a year or in some cases more. Uh, but that wasn't me. But I think there was another thing that he talked to me about a lot, Jack, and again, not trade identification, but the mental side of trading, uh, what you have to do, the fact that you're, own, you're your own worst enemy uh, as a trader, uh, you, you'll never, as a discretionary trader anyway, a, a systematic trader is a little different, but as a discretionary trader, you're never going to completely overcome your emotional urges to do the wrong thing, but you have to recognize that you, those urges are your own worst enemy, and at least you have to manage them. Uh, you don't always do a perfect job managing them, but it's the challenge that you have to have. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, it's the mental game that's the hardest part. And I think the other impact that he had on me was learning that you do the same thing at the same time every day. Uh, that trading was a process. That you, you just didn't come in and start shooting from the hips, but you had to think through what you're not necessarily what your game plan is in terms of I'm going to buy or sell this, but what time do you put your orders in? How do you manage your orders? How do you uh, how do you manage your overall portfolio? How do you get into uh, into the process of trading itself? How do you you know analyze what you've done after the fact? And those were also things that I think he was instrumental in 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 me at least starting down those roads. Of course, I've had to wander down those roads by myself, uh, as all traders do at some point. Did he, uh, you, you, did he speak um, for any specific uh, advice about how to handle the emotional side, and that sort of we are our own, our, we are the enemy, we are our own worst enemy? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was he knew that I was trying to be, uh, you know, I was trying to be a position trader. Uh, I, I wanted to be disciplined. Uh, I wanted to be a chartist, and I think for him it was just uh, constantly being on my case. That what am I doing, looking at the markets? That uh, I, for me, it's the recognition that if I sit and watch the computer screen all day, I'll sabotage myself. Uh, I mean, inevitably, I will make the wrong decisions. I, I will get out of winning trades. I will. I will. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll over. I'll over-trump myself on not getting into a trade. I'll second-guess an order that I have in. Uh, is the fact that you, you make a decision for me. I make a decision when the markets aren't open, when I don't see screens flashing, when I look purely at the chart and not at any sort of blinking, mesmerizing, idiot box. Make decisions, write orders, place the orders, and live with it. it, it it's for me... It's that practice of discipline, and then I think it's uh, it's the patience to wait for the right pitch. Uh, that that I think was the hardest thing for me uh, early on. Jack was determining what is my pitch, what is the uh, what's the pitch that I'm willing to swing on, whether I hit the ball or miss it. Uh, you know, I'm not. Uh, you watch the World Series in baseball, and they give you the stats for every player that's up to base. That you know, if it's inside high ball or a betting average is this or that is. What exactly is my setup? Uh, I think it's something every trader needs to come to terms with. Is what is the trade that you're willing to do? Uh, can you uh, can you with great specificity define what your swing is and uh, uh, that I think is is a difficult thing, but only when a trader comes and answers that question, do I think a, a trader can then start dealing with issues of sizing and leverage and scaling and trade management and the rest. You first have to know what what is a trade for me, and uh, right. that's something every trader has to decide on their own. And different for every trader, obviously. Well, it is. It is different for every trader, and I, I think that's the real danger of people who try to uh, mirror themselves and uh, after other traders is because sooner or later, you, every trader is going to have a drawdown, have some difficult, challenging periods. When I go through a challenging period, I know I know why. I understand it. I understand it from a probability standpoint. I understand it from a metric standpoint. I understand it from a market cycles point of view. 
But if somebody's just simply trying to copy every trade that I do, at some point in time when I go into challenging places, uh, 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 somebody who's trying to copy me can't live there. They, they can't go through that period. They won't understand it. And so that's why somebody needs to, every trader needs to know exactly what it is they're doing in the markets because it's the only way they're going to survive the challenging parts. Yeah, I, I just remember just for a while here that you mentioned we're talking about before how you you know if you, you make decisions during market hours it sort of messes you up. And my own experience as well. But I I, I thought of uh, Ed Sakota's comment when I interviewed him, and I, I I said you don't have a quote screen on your desk, and he said uh, having a quote screen on your desk is like having a slot machine. You you have end up feeding it quarters all day, and I think yeah. that's kind of a colorful way of saying the same thing. Um, now you, you're talking about um, how if it's not your own approach, you know, you, how do you deal with the difficult periods? But let's say you've got your own approach, how, that does that does raise the question, which you know, we all go through, all traders go through. How what do you do uh, yourself when when you hit those periods where just everything you do seems to just be wrong, and uh, you keep on getting you're getting stopped out at the extremes, and just everything is just not, it's just you're out of sync. Uh, your luck's running bad, if you will, even. But you know, what do you do in those periods? Um, well, I think I just cut size. Uh, I mean, I've I've in the past uh, tried to say, okay, I'm in a tough period. What do I need to change in my trading? And that usually leads me down a rabbit trail that doesn't end well, uh, because you're always then reacting to the last trade or the last series of trade, and you're trying to optimize things, and that's not the solution for me. Uh, I just accept the fact that uh, you know during the course of a 12-month period, my profits are going to come from three, maybe four months. Uh, I, you know, have a couple months of adversity and and a few months of, of of treading water, and and that's the reality. And when I go through a losing streak, uh, especially if I've had three, four, or five good trades in a row, my general way of thinking is the first time I have two wrong trades. Uh, back to back is the time to start cutting sizing, and so I will cut sizing down from uh, a risk of 80, 90, 100 basis points, which is one percent of capital, and I'll I'll start cutting it down, and uh, you know I might get as low as 30 basis points or a third of one percent of capital on a trade if I'm in a period where I'm I'm I'm, I'm treading water or starting to sink a little bit. To, to clarify, you do that by cutting position size, obviously, not by changing your, your no. stop point. Right? No, no, I, I, I don't. I try to keep trading the same way. I think that that's the only way that eventually I'll come out of a drawdown uh, and, and get back on track is if I don't, if I don't, uh, if I don't change anything. I need to – now, that doesn't mean to say, hey, in the last 10 trades, were there some kind of sloppy ones in there? I mean, that's a question you have to ask is, is uh, you know, all of a sudden uh, you're in a losing period. You, you know, a trader has to say, really, really, was that, was that my pitch? Or, uh, it, you know, so you got to remind yourself and step back and say, okay, let me, let me self-review. What are the trades that I want to do? You always, I just find I always have to preach to myself. You know, I've got to constantly remind myself, what is my trade? What are my risk management protocols? What are my trade management guidelines? Uh, am I on track? Am I doing trades that a year from now I can look at a chart, because I am a chartist, and look at that chart and say, okay, I know why I did that trade. That trade made sense. Whether it made money is irrelevant, but was it a trade that made sense relative to how I analyze markets, enter trades, and manage trades. And if it is a trade that makes sense, I have got to just accept the fact that I'm going to go through some losing periods, and I have to keep doing what I'm doing. And uh, in trust, I've been through enough drawdowns that I can trust that at some point in time, the way I trade makes sense, and I'm going to come out of it. And uh, just try to hang on. All right. Um... You talked about the your your one mentor. Did you have any other mentors uh, uh, that were significant? I I, I did, it, but not as significant. I, I mean, along the way, there were a few chartists that you know would give me 
uh, you know, a couple words of wisdom, uh, give me some advice, or give me some things to think about. I think, I think the biggest one, Jack, was was a chartist who said, you know, Peter, uh, you, you have to have an edge to make money, and being a chartist is not your edge. A chart pattern does not give you an edge in the markets. Uh, that was sobering at the time, and it didn't make complete sense to me maybe for five years or so, but it does today. I get what he was saying. I understand what he was saying. Uh, and so there were, there were cases of, of that type of thing where other traders who were chartists would, uh, would, would speak some wisdom into me that, uh, you know. And, and that's an important point. So before we leave that, uh, the chart pattern doesn't give you an edge because everybody else can see the same chart pattern, I would assume, right? Well, yeah, and, and chart patterns are subject to failures. Uh, I mean, and, and I think one thing you and I will agree on, Jack, is when the chart pattern fails, that's more significant than when the chart pattern forms. Uh, I right. mean, the good trades come from failed chart patterns, and charts morph, and you think you have a handle on what a chart is doing, and then, you, you know, it changes up, and it spends another two, three months chopping around, and eventually forms something else. And it's in the process of that morphing, and a morphing chart is nothing more than a whole bunch of patterns that fail and don't do what they're supposed to do. And over a period of five, six months, you may look at a chart and say, you know, within that pattern, there were 10 patterns that failed. And it's the composite of those patterns and how, how a chart evolves. That's where, that's where the edge comes from, that in your sizing. Right. Yeah, it's, it's eerie how... how... I, it's almost listening to myself sometimes in, in, in opinions when I listen to you. Uh, um, and as you probably know, you know, in, in my own book on technical analysis, the thing that I call the most important rule is exactly what you're just saying, which is uh, failed patterns are more important than the, than, than the classic patterns themselves. Yeah, and just let me let me give you a, let me give you a plug here too, Jack. For those of you who are listening that have not ordered Jack's book, which will be released. Uh, by Wiley uh, in January, right? I've ordered it, Jack. Yeah, I haven't... January. Yep. So they can see it on the screen, but there's a whole bunch in that book on charting, and uh, some of it I, I completely agree with it. Some of it aren't my particular style, but there's a lot of attention that Jack gives uh, to charting, and it's, uh, this is a book that uh, is really a textbook, and I highly advise everybody order it uh, on Amazon now so that they get it when it's shipped. Uh, I appreciate that, Peter. Uh, let, uh, you know, I, I, I know you were at Commodities Corp because, well, because I was there at a different time, and, uh, and it was quite an interesting place in its heyday. Uh, how, how did you, when were you there? How did you get there? What traders did you meet when you were there? Did you learn anything from those traders? Why did you leave? Tell us a little bit about the Commodities Corp experience. Uh, well, that was a fascinating, fascinating experience. You know, up, as you know, up until the early 80s, Commodities Corp pretty much uh, had all inside traders. There were, there were, there were internal traders. They, you know, they started off as systematic traders. They had a lot of numeric schemes and computerized screen schemes, and it's, uh, it's how they traded. And, and uh, then I think in about 83, you may know the year is better than me, 83, 84, uh, in the early 80s, some of their systems weren't performing as they would have liked. And, and uh, they had some traders who were very good, uh, uh, Marcus, you know, and Sakota uh, uh, and some others who were quite excellent traders. Covenor, Covenor was there at the same time. Yep. Bruce Kovner probably, for me, was the best. I mean, in, in my mind and how I think Bruce Kovner uh, would be my hero as a trader. Uh, but it's, uh, they started what was called a trader evaluation program. You remember that, Jack, the TEP program. And uh, what they do is uh, they'd find some traders they felt were promising. And they'd say, okay, we'll give you, a, we'll give you 100 grand and we're going to watch you closely. And uh, there was a grid that they went by to get what they would consider to be fully funded, whatever that meant for a trader. Obviously, my level of fully funded funding was not uh, was very different than what uh, Paul Tudor Jones felt was his level of being fully funded. But you had to go through the TEP program and do certain performances over either a two or three year period, uh, after which you're just kind of booted out of the army, so to speak, or 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 you. 
establish a new level of funding, and as along the way, they keep pumping your funding. Uh, and so I uh, went through the TEP program, uh, got out of it in two years, and at the time, I think you had to do, I think it was 22.5% annualized rate of return, or it was 25% over two years. Over three years, you had to do, uh, I think it was 20 or 22% to get to the point where you, you exited the TEP program. And, uh, you know, it was a great experience, and I traded Commodity Corp until uh, 92, 93, and it's at oh, that I didn't realize point, we did that long, yeah. 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 And it's at that point where I kind of uh, really wound down my trading. I actually, as you know, Jack, left the business for 10 years and pursued some other things and didn't didn't trade, didn't have a quote machine, didn't uh, trade a contract of commodities barely for, uh, again, until 2006. And so as part of that, uh, I, I wound down my Commodity Corp thing, and of course then Commodity Corp was sold to Goldman Sachs, and I think it was 98 and moved to London and pretty much disassembled. Well, but, why uh, did you, uh, sorry, Peter, why did you end up leaving Commodities Corp, and why did you go through this hiatus where you stopped trading? Well, I, I was burned out. Uh, I mean, you know, this was back in the day when I was just pretty much trading myself. I didn't have enough of a structure around me. And, you know, back then we didn't have 24-hour markets in the futures, but we did in Forex. And uh, at Commodities Corp, you, you, you traded, when you traded currency, you traded what's called an exchange for futures. And you'd actually trade the cash market, and then you'd get it exchanged into a futures contract. But those are 24-hour markets. And, you know, I'd send set a band and, and let uh, Commodities Corp uh, – Forex department know that I don't want to be called at night and unless the D mark leaves this band and then call me and I, you know, here I'm finding out I'm getting called hours of the night. My wife kicks me out of the bedroom and I had to move to a different floor at the house. And, uh, you know, at that point in time, you know, I had been in the business for almost 20 years. And that's, that's, that's a long time. Uh, that's, that's a long time for trading and especially a long time to be Kind of on 24-hour alert, at least in in relationship to the to the forex side of the of the business, and I just felt I needed a break. Uh, I was burnt out. Uh, I didn't have any disastrous years. I went flat for a couple of years, but I basically went flat because I my I sized all the way down. I think that toward the end I was you know risking 10 basis points or 20 basis points. Uh, but my love for trading was gone, and so uh, I exited the market and then came back in trading in late 2006. Did you say your Did you say your your love for trading was gone just now? It was. Before? It was. I was burnt. I was spent. Yeah, um, yeah, that's yeah, and that's like yeah. One of the things I when I give talks on a lot of times I end on, you know, all the points that are important. The point I end on is you have to love what you're doing and. Uh, and it sounds like you, you know, by, if you lost that love, that was the right thing to do to stop trading. At yeah, that point. I did. I did. I mean, I just it, it wasn't in my blood anymore. And uh, and so, but 2006. I mean, I remember that conversation precisely. I remember where I was in my house. Uh, my wife was standing. I was sitting at my desk. My wife was standing to my left, and I said, "What do you think if we start our trading up again?" <laughs> And she's going, I don't know if I like that, you know, because she realized that, hey, trading's a tough job. I mean, it's not easy to be a trader. It's uh, it, it's all consuming. Uh, it, it involves dedication. If you're not dedicated, if you're not seeking excellence, you might as well not trade. And so you have to be committed. I mean, it's a commitment to seek the excellence you have to have. It, the, the diligence that's required is extraordinary. And and uh, but I made that decision that I want to go back into trading. What were you, Peter? What were you doing in that hiatus period? Uh, that was quite, I guess, almost what, like eight years or so. Yeah, uh, nine years. Yeah, nothing, nothing for part of it. Uh, just recovering, reading a lot. Uh, then I got involved in uh, a, a little bit in uh, in politics issue. I actually ended up getting registered as uh, certified as an NGO at the United Nations because I was involved in, in some philanthropic uh, issues. I got involved in the AIDS issue. I got involved in uh, in a number of other things in which were being dealt with by a branch of the UN called ECOSOC. 
Uh, and so uh, I helped some nonprofits get going, did philanthropic work, and uh, uh, spent a lot of time just 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 trying to uh, stay busy. Put put my money at the time into uh, what ended up being fortuitous into uh, into mutual funds with Fidelity. And of course, this was the '90s, and we all know what happened in the '90s. I got clocked in 2000, but uh, nevertheless, uh, then the market recovered, and so for the most part, I was committed to mutual funds. During so you just kept your money in there. You weren't uh, you weren't doing any timing. That you just put it in, wrote it up, wrote it down, wrote it back up again. That, that you, you, you were very much a non-trader with that that money. Yeah, I was. I mean, it was passive. I was not active. I you know I'd every once in a while look at performance of some of the mutual funds and try to figure out. Uh, maybe which one was hot, but but that I found was not a really good idea because then you end up uh, 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 moving money into what was hot last year, which isn't necessarily the thing that's going to be hot in the year forward. And so I probably underperformed relative to the general market because I was kind of chasing the vertical speed indicator. Uh, for those who are pilots, they'll understand that you're always behind the curve on that. And, but nevertheless, I, I, you know, I was a passive investor during that period of time. Did not have a quote machine. Actually, it was a big adjustment, Jack, because th then in 2007 I had to come back, and uh, there were two things that that were facing me. First is uh, the things that I did prior to exiting the market would they still work? I, I mean, is classical charting still a viable thing to do? Uh, you know, or, or have the markets changed to such a degree? The, the other thing was that all of a sudden we're in electronic markets. You know, you you, you get a computer platform. Uh, I started trading again with interactive brokers. That that was the first place I started trading when I started trading again. But you're trading off of a computer platform. You're not calling anybody. Uh, you you're, you're managing your own order flow and and uh, you, you know I had to learn that and. You know there are some personalities to the electronic trading world that that didn't exist in the in in, in the pit exchange world, and uh, I think that there was a learning curve by the exchanges themselves on electronic trading. There were some really weird things that would happen uh, to price action early on because they just didn't have the electronic trading uh, technology where it is today, and so. Uh, I found out that uh, the way I traded prior to uh, uh, when I stepped back still worked, and uh, it, I had to learn how to not call people on the phone and enter my orders, and, and it really became a function so, of being an order enterer. So even though, of course, the market we'd gone through this whole transition of the pits going away and electronic trading becoming uh, the uh, virtually totally uh, the way people trade, and then we had also a tremendous increase of people from when we both began. Trend following was really just a small little segment of the market, and you know people who did that were a little like uh, the exceptions by far, and to a point where trend following and uh, systems and all that were were all, you know all over. So. Uh, did, did those things did not change in your opinion or in your observation the way markets mm -hmm. behave? No, they didn't. As a matter of fact, Jack, uh, 2007, which was my first full year back, uh, you know, after after the hiatus, 2007 was the, my first full year back in in the trading. In 2007, uh, you know, I I I popped a 57 percent return, and 2008 came back with over a hundred percent return. That's the last year, by the way, that I doubled my money. I haven't doubled it since uh, in a year. But uh, you know, I think I was uh, 120 plus in 2008. Uh, and so the first two years I was back was splendid, uh, splendid years, and. Uh, it, it, but I think that there has been a change in personality in the market. I mean, I've, I think that I've had to make adjustments as a chartist, particularly in trade management, uh, due to the fact that we now are in markets where high-frequency trading operations, which are basically crooks that are front-running everybody else's orders, account for, uh, depending on what data source you're looking at, 50, 60, up to 70% of the volume in the day are by 
people who know your orders in advance of you placing them almost. Uh, uh, and plus you have a lot of ag algorithmic traders, you have uh, the huge, it's a huge, the, the huge hedge funds now, the, the, the trend followers, there's the, the billions of dollars that are in trend following systems and so you do have somewhat different marketplaces and price behavior I think today than we did back in the 1980s, 1990s and so specifically, uh, you know, some examples of how how the behavior of market. You're talking about the influences, but specifically, how does that manifest itself in in charts or market behavior, and how 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 has it caused you to alter the way you trade, uh, even if it's only around the edges? Well, I, I think those uh, those who are chartists that let's say, you know, I'll go with a high low close bar chart, or I may look at a candlestick chart, or I may look at a close only chart. I mean, those are kind of the the three things that I look at sometimes point and figure charts, but uh, for those that, that do candle candle charts, they I think uh, they are aware that these spindles are huge these days. The spindles off the real body are much larger than they used to be, and and so I think the algorithmic traders and the high frequency traders have learned uh, how to get the biggest possible spindle that they can get with the least amount of energy on their part to get it. And, uh, it, it, and so they're fading orders, they're fading, they're fading the, the ladder. And, uh, and so as a result, you, you tend to get volatility. Back in the olden days, you know, market would come out and, you know, if you could figure out the trend of the first hour, you pretty much had a, a good guess on the trend of the whole day. As a matter of fact, the Board of Trade back in the days of the bond pit actually put out a program uh, for that where you could determine whether it's a trend day or a non-trend day. And that was pretty much true across the board where now it doesn't matter. You can start trending one way and, you know, you, you, you can double back. Markets can double back two, three, four times during the day. The thrusts that uh, take place during the day are, are just not reliable indicators of what the what the market's going to do at the end of the day. And so the big thing for me is I, I don't like the 24-hour markets. I, you know, I tend to enter orders on stops and exit orders on stops. I, I don't want stops sitting in there in the middle of the night. I'm willing to risk the gap. Uh, there are some markets that I think are thick enough to have, that I'm willing to let an order sit in the market during the night. The Euro US is one. Uh, gold is not. I, I mean, the, the, the dollar yen, I, I work orders 24 hours a day because for goodness sakes, when I'm sleeping, that's actually when the big volume is there. And so, uh, but a lot of markets, I don't want orders in overnight. And to tell you the truth, I really don't like getting trapped early in the day once we start opening the markets up. There's, in a lot of markets, there's no longer an official open and closing anymore. Of course, there's an official settlement price, but in some cases, the markets keep trading after the settlement price, such as gold and the dollar index. But at some point in time, they do close down for 5, 10, 15 minutes. I want to know where the markets are when they close down. For me, that's the most right. important this, the, price of the day. Is the implication of what you're saying, which with the much larger intraday swings uh, when you're talking about the candle bars and outside, you know, spindles outside, for those who are not familiar with candle bars, essentially meaning that there's more price activity that's outside, outside the range of, between the open and close. Um, does that mean that you don't put in stops intraday, you wait for the close and exit only if the close is beyond your stop point or do you still use intraday stops even though you may not use overnight stops? But do you still use intraday stops? Yeah, in most cases I do, but I, I don't like them in there early in the day because you, you tend to get a lot of volatility early, let the markets calm down and then stick it in. Um, okay, so do you wait like for the first hour of, uh, yeah, of the official? First, first half hour I'll look. Uh, you know, in some cases the markets are liquid enough that I can trust putting it in pretty early. Um, you know, I'm involved in, 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 in the Euro stock, stock index, which is traded over in Europe. Uh, you know, when I wake up at 4.30 in the morning, mountain time, 
you know that market's cooking by then, and so I, you know, I can put a stop in there. I mean, I, I can depend, but also I don't want to. You know, some people put a stop one tick below yesterday's low or something like that. I mean, that's just inviting trouble, and so I want to make sure that I at least, uh, uh, at least get out of the range of what the high frequency trading operations possibly can do. But more important than that is, uh, you know, I want to know where market's going to close. I mean, for me, the closing price of the day is the single most important price. And so if I have to go to just one chart type, it would be a line chart. It would be a closing price chart. Uh, if I was limited to just one chart, that's the one I'd look at and make my decisions based on that. Uh, and if there is a single price in the week that's the most important price, it's the Friday close price. And so that would be the single most important price I, I actually look at. That's the price to me that matters because that's the price at which people have to margin a position and hold it over a two-day period risking the Mondays open. And so the people that are, you know, the, the quant traders, the high-frequency traders, the day traders, you know, they're gone by the end of the day, and so the price that you have at the end of the day is a price that's set by people that are willing to hold the position and not be and not be trying to run everybody's stop. And uh, it, 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 and so that's uh, for me the key thing is uh, where did the market close? And, uh, and, and because the most important that. price is on Friday's close, that I guess is the source of your rule of not holding a losing position over the. Uh, if yep. you're still buying on Friday. Yep, yep, absolutely. And I still, and I, there are times yeah. when I still believe in the trade jack. I mean, on Friday, the market closes, and I look at the chart, and I say, I still believe in this chart. I still believe in the case. I still believe in the trade. Uh, but 90% of the time, I'll exit the position anyway if it has a little loser. Let's say I got in the trade on a Wednesday and a breakout, and it just hasn't followed through yet. And, and if you still believe in the trade, how do you get back in? Uh, sometimes I don't. Uh, I mean, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Uh, I mean, you know, the next week may give me another opportunity. The market may give me a two, three week flag. It may give me a hard retest on Monday or Tuesday and give me a lower risk place to get in. But there are times when uh, you got to be willing to say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, my my year is not to be dictated by by one given market. If I have to be dependent on one market to make my year, then I'm in trouble. Uh, and, and I think there's there's a real there's a there's a real challenge for a trader not to become obsessed with a given market. And so I have to accept the fact that uh, it, the trade is not just direction. The trade is timing. And if one of them is wrong, then the trade is wrong. And uh, and so if I'm right on direction and wrong on trading, on the timing, it's a wrong trade. If I miss the trade, there's another one that's going to come down. The, the that That's the thing that's always amazed me, is if I just wait long enough, there's always another really good trade that will set up. Right. <laughs> uh, well, you, uh, on this rule, let's, let's take the rule of Friday close, but you're, out, you're behind the trade, you get out. Have you? I know you analyze your own trades. Have you actually done statistics and found what percent of the time that that's been was the right decision? What percent of the time it's not been? Do you do you or do you just have a sense of it? No, I just have a sense of it. It's not a metric that I that I study. I mean, there's a lot of metrics I'll look at. That's not a metric because that's kind of a second guess metric. And uh, you know, and I and I don't. You know, there's enough self guessing that goes on that I I. I uh, uh, I'm, I'm more concerned about the mistakes I, I, I actually make, not necessarily the markets that I miss, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 it does. We, let me go back just briefly to something we talked about, you were talking about before, but just uh, just a brief aside about the uh, uh, the uh, free high frequency trading and sort of front running trades and all that. Now, is it really all that different um, from Back in the day when we had the floors and the floor brokers knew where the orders were and and if you were stops and would run stops and which was hardly you know news to anybody. Uh, so is it, are we just in a more in an uh, electronic uh, or high tech version of it? Uh, and isn't the same money as a percent of all money still coming out or or is it actually worse than it was in the day of floor traders? 
Well, it certainly was bad in the day of floor traders, particularly in some of the New York markets as well as the mercantile markets. Not so bad at board trade, but uh, and so some to some sense, it's just the next evolution, right? I mean, we all know the floor brokers knew where the stops were. They gunned for the stops. They faded the stops. I mean, it's just what you had to live with. But now I think it's different you know, in two ways, Jack. First. The quants are dealing with with such a tremendous amount of of of, of data. They can handle so much data uh, that they they develop uh, algorithms with, which I think tend to say, you know, we can expend very little amount of act, of of energy here. Let's say to get a 50 pip move in uh, in, in dollar yen. Uh, and so they have a sense. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. But the big difference is the high-frequency traders because they're running orders. I mean, the floor brokers didn't know your, you know, there was in some cases they knew an order was sitting there resting, but but that was against exchange regulations. Where now, uh, now these exchanges openly accept what I call bribes from high-frequency traders who. Who are plugged into the data stream, you know, inch from where it comes out, you know, they've got that millisecond edge on me, which means that, you know, I, I look at if I'm working an order and trying to trying to put a limit order in, and I see a market and it's got a bid and offer, I'm willing to do what's called cover the cover the spread. I'm willing to cover the bid offer spread, which means if I'm seeing a, a the S and P's are bid at some price, offered at another price, and tick higher. I'm willing to buy it at the tick higher, which means I'm willing to cover the spread. Well, I'll set that order up, I'll click enter, and all of a sudden that offer disappears. And it disappears because high frequency traders knew my order went in. They know my orders. And that's a big edge that the floor traders didn't necessarily have with the data crunching that we do now. I, I mean, hey, uh, exchanges like Are you saying they. they they see the order or they're just quicker in executing? No, they know the order. They know the order. They trade against the order. They'll take the other side of the order. I mean, Jack, what's happening is is, is criminal, of course. Uh, you know, Michael Lewis wrote a book on this called Flash Boys where they talk about it. A wonderful book, by the way. Anything by Michael Lewis is a wonderful book. But, you know, Flash Boys goes into great detail about how these high-frequency trading operations work uh, and, and, and really details in great detail why basically uh, exchanges like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, they're nothing more than uh, getaway drivers to a robbery. And, uh, you know, in my opinion, it's criminal trading against an order that you know exists, and that's what they do. But you know, I guess that's that's the world we need to live in, so we need to adapt to it. And, and the big source. So you're saying, revenue, you're saying it's worse than in the days of floor trading. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so we, I, I looked here about a year or two ago, Jack. I looked at average daily vo, uh, range, and I, relative to the 1980s, early 1990s, and adjusted it for price, for flat price, right? I mean, if you're trading. A dollar copper versus three dollar copper. You 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 really would expect that you're going to have three times the daily range, but it's worse than that. It was more like four and a half times the daily range, which means the volatility of the markets today is more than compensating for flat price differentials to where markets were in 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 back in the pit days. And so I, I frankly think that where floor brokers, while they did run stops, largely did a better job at providing liquidity in orderly market than the high frequency traders are today. They're basically trying to manipulate volatility for their own benefit. And when you talk about putting in an order to get moves away from you, couldn't you just solve that by just, when you know you want to go get into a market, just doing it as a market order? Well, you do the same thing. If you cover the spread, that is a market order. But right. the thing, you know, and so so it is, in effect, it is the same thing, right, Jack? But here's the thing is people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to lose the bid offer spread because I'm going to put in a bid. If I'm buying, I'm putting in the bid. Well, guess what? I mean, if, if they're doing that, they're just, they're, they're fooling themselves. Because, in effect, by the time they're buying their bid, that is the offer. 
And so right. they're only able to buy it because that becomes the offer. Where actually, right. if you put in a, if you put in a market order, you actually get you get filled. If I'm buying at the market, more often than not, I'm going to expand the bid offer spread and get filled one tick past the existing offer.